Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. So as we continue to cover the Sean Great case, and we will, you're listening to all of those disturbing details, and we'll talk more about that case in a minute. But right now, as promised, I have a very, very special interview for you. As you know, we were carefully covering the Claude Tex MacGyver case, minute by minute, day to day, gavel to gavel coverage. Well, joining me right now via Skype, I wish I had them in the studio, but Skype will just be as good as any. Joining me is the entire prosecution team in the uh, Claude Tex MacGyver case. Let's start off. We have with us Clint Rucker, Salita Griffin, Adam Abate, Kara Convery, and Siri Yelamaraju. Great to see all of you. I'm so happy that you're joining us here on Long Crime. Thank you so much. Hi, we really morning. appreciate you having us. Well, now, here's the deal. I know, Mr. Rucker, I, I know you will uh, speak mostly for the group, but I'm going to open this up to anybody. So when I ask any questions, if anybody wants to, wants to jump in, please feel free. Does that sound good? Good. Okay, well, first of all, let me just say from everybody here, it's great to have you on. We really enjoyed watching you um, for weeks, days on end. It was great to watch from a lawyer perspective and also from a trial coverage perspective. So let's start off with where we're at right now. What is your reaction to the verdict? Extremely satisfied. Um, you know, in this case, we worked really hard to stand up for Diane MacGyver. We believed in the prosecution of the case, and it's uh, really satisfying to know that the jurors uh, understood the facts and the evidence and came to a verdict that we believe kind of speaks the truth about what happened on that evening of September 25, 2016. Is there a sense, though, is there a sense of disappointment in that the jury voted not guilty for malice murder? And the reason I say that is it, it means that they didn't technically believe that Mr. MacGyver intentionally killed his wife. And that seemed to be the crux of your team's argument. But instead, what they said was, look, she was killed during the commission of a felony, aggravated assault. But if you look at the definition of that, that's not entirely what the main crux of your argument was. It was more that he intentionally killed her, not that he wanted to harm her and something happened. So when you see that and you saw that they voted not guilty for malice murder, what is your take on that? Well, you know, we had the opportunity uh, to speak with the majority of the jurors after uh, the rendering of the verdict. And uh, it's not disappointing at all. Um, we believe that there was clear evidence of motive, and uh, in speaking with the jurors, we know that there was a large group of them that felt that same way. Uh, we indicted the case the way we did to offer the jury an option, uh, understanding that in Georgia, motive is not a necessary requirement in order to prove murder. And so for us, um, Malice murder, which means the deliberately intended act of killing a person, versus felony murder, which is the intentional shooting of Diane MacGyver uh, with the handgun, uh, which causes her death, uh, for us brings about the same result. And so uh, it's not disappointing at all. Well, let's talk about that. So when you read about what the jury said after their verdict, there's been talk that this was a compromise verdict, that the majority of them thought that this was in, that they wanted involuntary manslaughter and that a minority wanted um, malice murder. And after the judge uh, granted that Allen charge and said, go back, continue deliberating. I know you say you're deadlocked, but I think you can come to a decision. You're almost there. There's, a, there's some experts who say, look, if the jurors who wanted involuntary manslaughter, if they would, and that carries up to 10 years in prison, if they knew that voting in favor of felony murder would have been a mandatory life imprisonment sentence, they might not have voted for that, and they might have still been deadlocked, and there might have been a mistrial. What do you say to that? Uh, I just call it speculation. Uh, you know, in Georgia, jurors are never told uh, the requirement of sentencing. That's not part of their role, except if it's a death penalty case. Uh, and so as long as I've been practicing law here, uh, judges are the ones who are charged with the responsibility for sentencing. And, um, you know, we carefully picked this jury. Um, the majority of them had advanced degrees. They were very, very uh, smart. They are people who are kind of ingrained in our community. And uh, I believe they would have taken their jury oath seriously, and I believe that they would have rendered a verdict irrespective of whether they knew what the sentence was or not. So the criticism has been there that really it didn't seem like a murder case. I mean, originally it started off as involuntary manslaughter and reckless conduct, correct? And then those charges were up to murder. What 
was it about this case that you said, you know what, this is more nefarious, this isn't an uh, uh, involuntary manslaughter, there's something more like a murder case here, because there's been a lot of criticism that this doesn't seem, if you look at the, the, the totality of the evidence, it, it seems that there was a reasonable doubt that this was a murder. So what, in your opinion, really made this a murder case? Right. So the, the uh, police department are the ones who brought the original charges for reckless conduct and involuntary manslaughter. Uh, and that was done before the district attorney's office actually conducted its independent investigation, which occurs for every homicide case here in Atlanta. And so uh, the police department did not have the benefit of most of the witness interviews that we did. They did not have the benefit of the financial information. They didn't know about the will. They didn't know about the financial stresses of uh, uh, Mr. MacGyver. And, um, and they didn't know that there were perhaps some problems with respect to the marriage and how they were handling their finances. And so, uh, in my opinion, um, at the time that those original charges were brought, uh, there was a lot that the uh, police department just did not know. And do you think that was a big part of the jury deliberations? Do you think they were thinking a lot about the financial motive or were they more concerned with, you know what, let's look at what actually happened to the gun, let's look what happened in the car, because I'm not sure, and you correct me, is it, is it that talking so much about the financial motive and what was going on in their relationship, did that seem to be more of a, a distraction than what was actually happening in the car? Because at the end of the day, you have a man who fired a gun, and the gun becomes the key piece of evidence. So when, and I'll tell you this first, when you saw the jury deliberating for such a long time, and they said that they were deadlocked, was there ever a moment in any of your minds that you said, you know what, maybe we shouldn't have gone so much towards the motive, maybe we shouldn't have focused so much on the financial, maybe we should have started more with the gun in the car, because maybe that's confusing the jury in a way? Uh, no, not really. And, and to be quite honest, I didn't think that the deliberations were unusually long. Uh, you have to remember, we uh, tried this case for the better part of six weeks. Uh, we called upwards of 80 witnesses. They were over 500 pieces of evidence, and they actually deliberated a little less than four days on this case. And so I didn't think it was an unusually long deliberation period um, at all for cases of this uh, complexity here in Atlanta. Um, and so it, the, the time did not cause me uh, any concern. Um, the financial motive uh, resonated with a great number of people because uh, there were several of the jurors who really were convinced that the defendant was guilty of malice murder. And so that information can be taken into account to give some rationale for why it was that he would have even wanted to shoot his wife in the first place. And so uh, I think that it was important part uh, to understand that uh, what the defendant had tried to do was to create the impression that uh, there were no financial difficulties. As you know, he made many public statements in which he claimed to be twice as wealthy as his wife. But when we looked behind the curtain, what we found out that that was not true. And it was one of many lies that were presented uh, during the trial uh, that we were able to show the jurors that this defendant uh, consistently uh, could not keep his stories together. Were you nervous during the when the the, the judge, the, excuse me, the jury came out and said, look, we're deadlocked. We can't come to a decision. Was there a point, and maybe for many of you, they said, hmm, I'm, I'm a little nervous about what's going on in there? Well, understand, this is what the jurors said. They asked to be instructed very specifically about the concept of intent here in Georgia. And after deliberating for a short period of time after that, they sent a note out that said, hey, listen, we are at an impasse with how we can resolve intent. And so the judge then brought them out, gave them another charge, which says, hey, go back, work a little harder, look at the law very carefully, consider the facts, consider other people's views, and see whether or not you can come to some resolution. And a short time later, uh, they were able to do that. And so uh, I am not surprised at all uh, that it turned out this way. I thought we presented a compelling case. Um, and so, um, as I said to you at the top of the uh, uh, interview, it's just very satisfying. Uh, be in this position now. Right. I, I love to hear the perspective of what's going on in your mind during the course of the trial. I think it's all interesting. We all try to guess. We try to guess what's going on in the mind of Tex MacGyver, his team, your team. So again, another key moment in the case was when two of the three witness tampering charges were dismissed. 
What did you think when that happened? Um, I thought that um, it was a little disappointing, but I did understand the judge's ruling. Um, I did believe, though, that those charges were appropriate to have been brought because I did believe that, um, you know, Tex McGyver consistently tried to influence and to have witnesses change uh, what his statements were uh, to the police. And so um, I understand that the, that the two charges that we lost were lost on what we would consider as lawyers legal technicalities, but um, it overall was not um, too much of a damper uh, because we still were able to go forward on the main charges in the case, which involved uh, the killing of Diane MacGyver. And yes, and then my question would be, was there ever a point when you said, you know, these charges, they, they may stick, they may not, but, but the question became for the jury, are, are, we, are we telling it the right, the right way, the right story? And, and I'm curious about this. I've always wanted to know, how do you decide who gives the opening, who gives the closing, who, um, how do you divide that up? What's the story that you wanted to tell the jury and by each uh, attorney? Right. I'll let Ms. Convery. You like the way that I opened that up to everybody? You like yeah. that? Yes, that was good. <laughs> um, I think I, hopefully, you know, people who watch the trial can see that um, each attorney who was involved in the case has really totally different styles, um, different presentation styles, different presence in the courtroom. Um, we had a, a variety of jurors from different walks of life, different parts of our county, and so it was important to us that we communicated. Um, Diane's story and the story of her death to them in the most effective way possible. And for us, that meant having everybody in a different role throughout the trial, but in an important one. We wanted the jurors to know and understand um, each of our perspectives, and so that's why I think we divided it up the way we did. And, Mr. Rucker, while we talk about dividing it up, i got to ask you the million-dollar question. I have seen a lot of closing arguments, but never have I seen a closing argument that featured an octopus and let alone an octopus video. Is that a common Clint Rucker closing argument move, or is that something unique to this case? Well, it, it's something that I do uh, from time to time, just depending on uh, the complexities of the case. Uh, I do it as a way to really capture the attention of the jurors, to kind of refocus them after they have had the opportunity to hear from defense counsel and um, kind of get them with their minds cleared away so that I can present my uh, argument to them in a fashion that uh, I, I believe will allow them to receive it and be very, very persuasive. And, uh, and in this case, um, it worked. Yeah, I mean, there's things that stood out from this trial, and we'll get into a minute about what you're going to take away from each moment from this case. But yeah, that was one thing that stuck out. I, I have to tell you, though, I, I really was impressed by the defense's um, case as well as the Don Samuel uh, and Bruce Harvey's closing arguments they they seem to raise in my mind at least and, I, and if you read the Twitter boards you read a lot of our comments from our, our watchers that there was seemed to be a lot of points of reasonable doubt so just to give you an idea that it was not entirely clear that Tex and uh, his wife Diane had a problem in their marriage. I mean, a lot of the testimony we heard said that they seemed to love each other. You also have that nothing out of the ordinary happened um, in the days, the weeks, the minutes before this shooting took place. You also have that we know Tex MacGyver did suffer from a sleep disorder, but it was a question of whether or not it actually did affect the shooting. Um, also, you couldn't forget the testimony from one of the defense experts, uh, gun experts, who said it was impossible to have the gun upright and pointed in the back of the seat. And you look at the Danny Joe Carter story, matched what Tex MacGyver said. So when you hear this, and I'm listening to this, and I say, wow, that sounds like reasonable doubt. What was going through your minds when you heard the defense make their case? Well, really what we had to do was focus on the evidence that we presented. And even though they had the gun expert that said that the gun couldn't be pointed upright in the back seat, we had an expert that said that it could. The jurors were able to get back in the car, and I believe they could determine which expert that was telling the truth or which one they wanted to believe. Um, Don and Bruce did have good closing arguments, but when you're trying to figure out reasonable doubt or you're trying to explain to the juries what that is, it's not about what they would have wanted to see or what they could have seen. It's about did the evidence that we present create any reasonable doubt as to murder. 
And I think the evidence that we presented showed that even though people on the outside thought that Diane and Tex had a great relationship, um, if you delve deeper into the um, what was going on, it, that just wasn't the case. Um, so, I mean, they did a good job, but I think the evidence was there to, to sustain this conviction. Let, let me ask you this. In terms of just the murder charge, if Tex MacGyver never said anything after he shot his wife, didn't talk to Danny Joe Carter, didn't talk to uh, Jeff, Jeff Dickerson, didn't talk to Bill Crane, didn't make those statements that he made about getting money after Diane died, would you have still thought that this would have been a murder case or would you have kept it as involuntary manslaughter and reckless conduct? Because it seems that Tex, when you look back at this case, made it worse for himself. And uh, I guess I understand what, what your question and what you're saying. Um, I believe that we would have, like we do for every case, do an independent investigation on all the facts and the circumstances that are provided to us from, um, in this case, the Atlanta Police Department. Um, as we uh, do our independent investigation, we still would have looked at his finances. We still would have uh, done the search warrants that we um, did at his uh, condo as well as uh, at the ranch. And um, I believe through all of that, we would have still uh, come to the final conclusion um, and come out with the same charges of murder and felony murder and um, the additional charges. Um, I believe that the statements that he made were just kind of extra bonus things that we don't normally get, but um, they were just intrinsically uh, helpful and valuable to our case. But I believe even without those statements, we would have still had um, more than enough evidence to sustain a uh, murder conviction like we did. So in other words, when the defense says, hey, this is a red herring, you talk about the masseuse, or hey, it's a red herring when you talk about Jeff Dickerson, you would argue back saying that's a false statement. It talks about the larger story of what's happening between Tex and Diane? Right. And, uh, you know, remember, one of the things that uh, the defense attorneys did was they put the defendant's character at issue. Part of their defense, the crux of their defense, came from this notion that they propounded that uh, Tex MacGyver was a Southern gentleman, uh, that he loved his wife dearly. And so that was the reason why he could never have formed the intent to kill her. But when you look behind um, and in between those lines, what you find is something very, very different. You know, a person who desperately loves his wife the way in which they claimed would not sell every stitch of her clothing uh, within a day or two um, after her death, would not, you know, allow her ashes to remain at the crematory for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, after she was ready to be picked up, uh, would not have a masseuse uh, spend the night with him in his bedroom, the marital bedroom, uh, for weeks or a week after the homicide itself and then take her down to the ranch to spend uh, the weekend, uh, literally the one week anniversary after killing his wife, he was at the ranch where he shared with his wife with the masseuse. Now, I'm not claiming that they had some intimate sexual relationship. There was no evidence that we could find of that. What I am saying, though, is that these actions of this defendant were inconsistent with um, the portrayal that he continued to maintain. And I think that that was a critical uh, element in the case. And, and let me ask you the, the question that came up so much when we talked about it. If you were going to kill your wife, would you really do it in this way? And that really became a question many people were, were confused about. And I've seen cases before where defendants are found guilty and in situations where you say that's a strange way to kill your wife but the jury felt that that's uh it's not uh, improbable was there ever a point when you said you know what that's going to be something hard to get past that he, he shot her in a public place with danny joe carter his wife's best friend in the car to witness it seems not the optimal time to do this well you know you have to ask yourself uh, a rhetorical question um is there really ever an optimal time to commit a murder. Um, it's not the kind of thing um, that, uh, in my opinion, is ever done with perfection. Uh, in this case, I believe that uh, there had been an argument uh, the, the weekend prior, and I believe that um, the defendant in this case was looking for the opportunity in which to do it. Um, and because um, he had recently learned 
that a close colleague of Diane MacGyver's had accidentally discharged a gun in his home. I felt like he used that um, as the optimal excuse to do exactly what he did, when he did it, and how he did it. Um, I think that he believed that he would be able to manipulate Danny Joe Carter uh, into saying and supporting him that it was an accident. Um, and in fact, what we know is as soon as they arrived at the hospital, he began trying to manipulate her uh, by having her lie to the police, for which the jury did find him guilty uh, of that count in the indictment. So um, I agree with you. They're, they're, I've done many, many homicide cases, and, uh, and certainly uh, there are lots of them in which you ask yourself, why did he do it at this time, in this manner? But uh, it's very hard to come up with uh, rationalizations for uh, why people who kill uh, do what they do. Well, it's definitely a case that's going to stick with me. I'm sure it's going to stick with all of you. It was interesting to watch. It was fascinating to watch each of you put out your arguments and watch you in court. So, again, it was our pleasure to watch. It's our pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you for joining us. Um, we look forward to speaking with you again. And, um, again, really, it was great to have you on today. Thank you very Thank much. You. Oh, and uh, congratulations. I should say that as well. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, everybody. Thank you again. All okay, right. so that was, there you go. The Claude Tex MacGyver case. We'll update you about this case as soon as things happen, including a possible sentencing hearing later on in May. Uh, but again, Mr. MacGyver does face the potential of life in prison. What I want to do right now is switch gears. We're going to switch gears back to the great case. They're on break right now, uh, or they might be of a feed, but they haven't started up yet. What I want to do is play you some of the testimony that you might have seen earlier from today. Um, really compelling testimony from Lisa Riley, who was the nurse that examined one of the victims in this case, I should say Jane Doe, the w same woman that made that 911 uh, call to police and they were able to apprehend Mr. Great and save her. So she was examined for all of her injuries and I'm sorry ladies and gentlemen, I have to tell you, it's extremely graphic. It's extremely graphic but it's important nonetheless to hear this. We're going to play you some of Lisa Riley's testimony right now. <laughs> 